Hello and welcome to another episode of Laptop Retrospective and today we have a machine that I've probably been long overdue to look at and that is the HP workstation line called the ZBook. And this is the ZBook 15 Gen 3. Now as far as workstations go, it's pretty much got all the features that you'd expect to see of a workstation machine from this era with a couple of HP uh, sprinkles here and there. So a couple of the things that make a workstation from this era rather iconic is that you have an overly large power supply to drive all of the uh, higher wattage CPUs that are on the inside of the machine. And it was pretty common practice for the touchpad not to click and to have a set of buttons here at the bottom as well as a set of buttons here at the top for the point stick in this case which is a almost petrified plastic nub. I don't know if that was ever supposed to be rubber, but it's certainly not now. The Gen 3 of the ZBook is featuring 6th generation CPUs. Honestly, there's no real bad configuration for the CPUs on this thing, but we are talking about, in some instances anyway, uh, some antiquated tech. Because it's 6th generation Intel, you're not going to be running Windows 11, um, naturally. You're going to have to do a couple of other things if that's what you want to do to uh, load it on there. But let's talk about the specifications of this thing. So we're talking uh, essentially HQ style CPUs. So like the worst configuration you can get with this is a Core i5 uh, 6440HQ and then you've got your 6700HQ in the i7 and then your 6820HQ in uh, your top-of-the-line i7. Now you can also get this in Xeon processors, uh, which this one does not have, and you can get it in the Xeon uh, E3 line, the 1545M or the 1505M, and both of those are going to be obviously pretty beastly, and the thing to note is that they're also going to take um, different RAM, I believe. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, graphics so many graphics choices which is actually one of the reasons why the person that's getting this wants it is because it does have a little bit of graphical oomph even for a machine of its age and vintage so for your core processors you had an intel hd graphics 530 if it was xeon you had the p530 graphics and then you also had a discrete uh, nxm daughter card on the inside which would give you a whole schwack load of nvidia NVIDIA Quadro choices, and then one AMD Fire Pro choice was also available as well. Depending on all of this, you would either have Thunderbolt 3 present, DisplayPort 1.2, a couple of other uh, technologies that are specific to NVIDIA like Mosaic or AMD iFinity, that sort of deal. Speaking of your eyes, we should talk quickly about the panel. This is a uh, full HD panel at its worst, so 1920 by 1080. There was a 300 nit version, there was a 300 uh, ultra wide viewing angle version, there was a 300 nit touch screen ultra wide viewing angle, and then there was a UHD, which is a 3840 by 2160 panel that had uh, more color accuracy. Unfortunately, all of these panels are essentially 300 nits, so they're not going to be crazy bright. Memory was DDR4 uh, 2133 megahertz for the core uh, processors and they would max out at 64 uh, gigs of RAM uh, and there was four RAM slots on the inside of this thing. Now if you had the Xeon processors it was ECC DDR4 2133 so the RAM type is different as I mentioned earlier. When we get on the inside of this thing we're actually going to see that this is equipped with uh, two uh, M.2 drive slots and these are uh, 2280. They are rated NVMe, uh, thank goodness, with the uh, PCI slot, but only if they're the Z Turbo variants. Not entirely sure what that means, but that's what it's documenting here. But we'll learn more about that once we get on the inside of this machine. Ethernet and wireless, of course, are there uh, with Bluetooth 4.2 built in. WN, of course, was possible with 4G. And our USB ports are USB uh, 3.0, uh, nothing super fancy going on there. And then of course we do have Thunderbolt 3 present and we'll take a look at that in just a moment. 
All of this is being driven by a 90 watt hour battery, so pretty big on the inside, which we'll take a look at in just a second. So let's take a look at the ports and features that we've got. We do have a web camera and microphone array at the top of the machine. Nothing particularly unique about that. Uh, for those of you that are curious, this is as far as this hinge will open, so it's not a lie flat. We do have dedicated Wi-Fi and audio buttons up here, which are kind of flush and built in. We've got a full keyboard with numpad, which is pretty handy. We've already talked about the track point, or the, uh, the point stick buttons and uh, the non-click pad. We've got our power button over here, which we'll use shortly. And we've got just a big, chunky uh, chassis. So on the right-hand side, we've got our power plug, our two Thunderbolt 3 ports, HDMI, two USB-A uh, 3.0s, and our headphone microphone combo jack. Along the back, we just have the words mobile workstation, just in case you forgot. And then on this uh, side over here, we've got a SD card slot, another USB-A, our Ethernet, and a VGA port. So this is an interesting machine in the sense that it has a few what we would call in modern terms legacy ports, um, but it's also got a good mix of modern as well. Um, and that, oh, can't forget the... Uh, the smart card reader, which is like right underneath this chamfered edge. So this kind of brings me to an interesting point, is that this may be like one of the cheapest Thunderbolt 3 machines that you can get. Like these are not expensive units. If you go on eBay right now, they're usually falling around the 200, 300 Canadian dollar mark. And like they're not going to be like crazy powerhouses compared to modern workstations, but they're still going to be able to push uh, a lot of power down the pipe. So let's slide it over to the document camera and take a look at what things uh, appear to be on the inside. Now they do use uh, Torx screws for the bottom of this unit, but that is A-OK. -okay. We definitely have the technology to get in there with no difficulty whatsoever. I found that a Torx 8 uh, seemed to work pretty, pretty cozy. And they appear to be captive screws, which is nice. Alrighty. So with all of the screws loose, the easiest way usually is in just around the hinge here. And we're going to try a plastic pry tool first. So there's our edge. All right, crazy easy to get into. Like just peels right up, no stress. All righty, and here are a whack load of goodies uh, waiting for us. So we've got our RAM slots all on this side, uh, so we don't have anything hiding under the keyboard, which is convenient. We have uh, one M.2 NVMe here. We have our Wi-Fi Bluetooth card here, and it looks like uh, we've got our ribbon cable here for the smart card uh, reader module. And it also looks like underneath is where an M dot or a standard uh, two and a half inch drive bay would also go, or a another M dot two caddy. Our battery is surprisingly thick. You don't usually see them that thick. They're um, usually flat and more spread out across the chassis, which is pretty interesting, actually. It looks like we've got our CMOS battery that disappears underneath the battery due to the telltale black and red cable. And over here, we can see the daughter board uh, GPU module with a... <laughs> good chunk of the heat sink covering that and then a smaller piece covering uh, the CPU. And we can confirm that it is socketed because we can see the uh, gold uh, colored contacts just right along there on that edge. Now because this is going to a person that is eagerly awaiting it, we're not going to mess this up too bad. Oh, 
Here's our other M.2 slot right next to it. There's the screw post sticking up, staring me in the face. So theoretically, looking at the board, you could probably have two M.2 slots plus the two and a half inch base. That's a fair bit of storage. So yeah, I would say they've utilized space inside of this uh, pretty well. It looks like there's a spot for your SIM card underneath the Wi-Fi card there. And it also looks like your slot for the uh, WAN card is right here. So this is actually really interesting because it's like layers of cards because they used the thickness of, their, of the machine to their advantage. They built these high enough that your WAN card would fit underneath here and your uh, Wi-Fi card would be covered by the second M.2. And then your RAM slots are over here. So, like, I don't know what, when they were designing this, ended up being, like, the tallest pole in the tent. Where they're like, well, we can't make anything thinner than this component, so let's stack everything. But that's kind of clever. Um, I don't know if that was like their intent from the very beginning, or if it was a happy accident, or there were people at HP tearing their hair out trying to figure out where all this stuff was going to go. But in terms of serviceability, I've got to give them props. Uh, the only thing that's maybe a bit inconvenient um, is your uh, keyboard screws look like they're underneath the hood, so you'd loosen them from here. But Hey, if it means you don't have to snap off a keyboard lattice like you do on some of the Dells, then I am completely okay with that. Yeah. Now, I can understand why a lot of people in the comments over the years were talking about how much they like these things. It's starting to make a lot of sense when you look at it. It is definitely uh, a big, thick boy. Uh, no question about it. But it looks like they did everything... They respected that, and they worked with it rather than uh, working against it. Um, we got like a little tiny board down here that shows you the battery life indicator. That's nice. Okay, well, I'm uh, done gushing about the inside of this machine. Obviously, they designed it pretty well. I'll leave a link to the maintenance manual in the description if you want to know how to take apart every single piece. It's actually quite good. Um, but like I said, this is going to its new owner right away, so I want to make sure that all is in working order still when it arrives. So let's put the cover back on and see what this thing is like when we turn it on. All right, with everything back together here, that lid's got a nice strong magnet. Let's uh, power this thing up. So we do have a backlit keyboard. That's nice to see. And hey, for a sixth generation Intel, that is pretty snappy. No real complaints there. And it looks like we have loaded Windows 11 on this. I'm going to guess this is probably Tiny 11. Yeah, so it is the uh, i7 6820HQ, uh, 16 gigs of RAM, uh, two sticks to eight is what we saw on the inside. So plenty of room to grow there. Let's see what GPU this machine is running. So it's the NVIDIA Quadro uh, M1000M. So, and again, not like crazy powerful, but enough that you could probably do some very limited casual retro gaming on this thing. Um, but yeah, very, very snappy. Again, I suspect that this has been preloaded with Tiny11, uh, especially with that boot time. I've seen Tiny11 work on some pretty antiquated tech. Uh, so yeah, if you want to know more about Tiny11, uh, I don't know a whole lot, so I won't claim to be an expert, but I'm pretty sure that is what we're looking at here. So I'm actually really glad that I had the opportunity to look at a uh, Z-Book, because I know that over the years people have been saying, you should really check one of these out, and I, I can understand why. Uh, like, this is a pretty beastly machine in terms of its weight and thickness, but I think they've used that pretty well. And I would say that for, again, you're looking at 200, 250 Canadian dollars, you're getting Thunderbolt 3, 
you're getting some really strong CPUs. Obviously, there are some ways to load a modern version of Windows on it. It's a very, very serviceable. If you were in a pinch and you needed something with a dedicated GPU, even though it might not be crazy modern, uh, this is pretty attractive, not going to lie. And who knows, maybe I'll get the chance to look at some newer ZBooks in the future, but I can begin to understand what the appeal uh, might be. At any rate, if you've used a ZBook, I'd love to hear more about it in the comments down below, so let me know what your experience was like. And I hope you enjoyed watching this. If you are looking to maybe add one of these uh, to your fleet or, you know, you're just on a really tight budget and you want something that's crazy repairable, easy to open, really reliable, like the, the, the biggest challenge that uh, you would probably have is just finding your torque screwdriver um, or just going to buy one. <laughs> I'll leave some links in the description down below where you might be able to find one of these for the cheap. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.